My task of today is uh, just uh, to say that uh, due to our very extensive work, we have uh, come into the pitfall that uh, we uh, just uh, found out that HBNC cannot reflect uh, the, what would be the best approach to prevent cardiovascular disease. And that is, that is what I'm, uh, I will be talking about. So in a way that uh, cardiovascular uh, risk reduction is very important and uh, that uh, we should uh, use uh, some other also markers, I don't know which one, but uh, that uh, HbA1c is not enough. But let's, let's do the talk. So in that context, my agenda is that I would like to uh, remind you about uh, what uh, we were thinking about and what were our uh, uh, wrong thoughts about cardiovascular risk in diabetes, and of course that there is a major concern about that still, that lowering of, lowering of HbA1c was insufficient to prevent cardiovascular complications, that uh, then came CVOTs and gave us some surprising results, and finally, when achieving a sort of cardioprotectivity which can do, which we can do now, HbA1c targets should be uh, achieved uh, simultaneously, so it uh, preserves its value. But let's start from the beginning. We have always uh, appreciated very much cardiovascular risk in diabetes, and it was a major concern to us uh, uh, because of this, that everybody in the audience knows, and that, that uh, the patient with cardiovascular disease has uh, uh, a double, uh, a sort of doubled risk, at least doubled risk for uh, cardiovascular disease in comparison to those ones that do not have uh, diabetes, then uh, that this, uh, and uh, this is not frequently estimated, that if there is diabetes but also stroke and MI, this risk is eightfold, which is then uh, and uh, very, very dangerous, and this combination is not so infrequent. Then uh, there was a need of stratification even of cardiovascular risk, and that was done very recently at the, uh, by our fellows cardiologists, basically, to uh, very high, high and moderate risk. You can notice that there is no diabetic patient with low cardiovascular risk, and uh, there is a definition of what we consider as very high, high and moderate risk. Finally, if you, uh, as you can read down, uh, down in this sentence, uh, if you take a 50-year-old man with diabetes but no history of vascular disease is uh, uh, about six years younger at the time of the death than the counterpart with diabetes. So diabetes is eating up six years of his life. And finally, it was even at the beginning of this decade, 10 years ago, that we have explicitly said that comprehensive cardiovascular reduction is a sort of major focus of our treatment. So we uh, realized that we should do something about cardiovascular risk and not only about metabolic control or glycemic control. At the beginning, we thought that it would be easy uh, because the first epidemiological studies have shown these uh, rather beautiful results. Not so beautiful, but beautiful. If you look at this part of uh, uh, the curve and this part of the curve, you can see that in sort of almost linear way, if you decrease HbA1c, the, uh, the, the, the all-cause mortality goes down. Uh, nobody has emphasized from those results that the story is not that, uh, that simple because there is a second part of the curve when you go very much down with HbA1c that you increase the all-cause mortality. So that we, have, we do not have a sort of linear relationship but a J-shaped curve, in fact. And, but however... Uh, it was seen, and uh, in those studies it was found, that the optimal level of HbA1c be was between 
7.5 and 8 for insulin treated and 7 and 7.5 for those ones treated with oral agents. So, yes, uh, the decrease of HbA1c was, uh, I mean, efficient in reducing the risk, but there was something complicated in all this relationship. And uh, uh, with further studies, and with this one that you know by heart, and this is UKPDS study, it was shown that by decreasing of HbA1c, you cannot obtain a sig statistically significant reduction in cardiovascular mortality. So you can do that with uh, microvascular complications, but impossible with, uh, with fatal or non-fatal MI. And it was going down, but it was not significant. Uh, apparently, when you combine, uh, and, and uh, when, you, when, you, when you try to do it the other way around, when you put that into the prospect of other studies from UKPDS on, you have seen that the glucose control was able to decrease, but not significantly, the, uh, the, the cardiovascular events. It was around 9% or 15% for MI, but never in a significant way. The only study, and that was mentioned by my predecessor, was STINO2 study, that after 13 years, but of a combined treatment, not only blood glucose lowering, which lower HbA1c, but also lipid lowering and uh, uh, blood pressure lowering, we obtained for the first time a significant reduction of cardiovascular complications after these 13 years. So in comparison to microvascular complications, many things did not work, apparently, uh, or at least was not uh, easily related to the decrease of blood glucose, or in other words, HbA1c. And uh, then comes the worst, and that is then we, when we tried uh, artificially with our potential anti-hyperglycemic agent to decrease HbA1c in an aggressive or less aggressive manner, we discovered that the, we could increase cardiovascular risk. And those were the studies that have shown that uh, if uh, HbA1c goes down aggressively or in a less aggressive way, that we are increasing cardiovascular risk for death and for all-cause mortality. And that was an alarm which, uh, as you all know, caused the, uh, uh, the, 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 the beginning and uh, the need for the so-called CVOTs, cardiovascular outcome trials. Cardiovascular outcome trials that, uh, uh, that uh, wanted to show, first of all, non-inferiority of the new drugs for diabetes, and then, because uh, the people from the companies were very smart, they have shown some superiority. In other words, we discovered the agents that could decrease cardiovascular risk. Initially, anti-hyperglycemic agents, but you will see what the results have shown in these studies. So that was the, 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 the obligation, that was the, the, the requirement from FDA, uh, FDA that uh, almost all new drugs uh, for diabetes uh, designed to decrease basically hyperglycemia had to go through these trials, and this is the overall scheme of at least majority of the trials that were uh, over or are still going on. And uh, there are two uh, classes of drugs, as you know, that uh, have shown, have, uh, uh, shown uh, cardioprotectivity. The first one was GLP-1 receptor agonists, and there were, there were uh, the studies that uh, have uh, shown that you can get a cardioprotectivity or at least uh, the decrease of the number of composite endpoints, three composite endpoints, and uh, some in a sub-analysis of some specific cardiovascular events. 
that was considered to be a sort of revolution. And it was said that anti-hyperglycemic agents are decreasing cardiovascular mortality. But we will see whether it is, is it really decreasing of hyperglycemia that is decreasing cardiovascular mortality. Let's take the first one in this, in this group, and that is uh, the leader study with the uh, liraglutide, uh, sort of uh, uh, intermediate acting uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist. And you can see that this drug um, uh, de de significantly decreased primary outcome, three composite primary outcome, and the design was always the same. The primary, uh, the primary goal was to, uh, to, to see and uh, the, the outcome uh, of the three main components, uh, 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 or, or the total, uh, it was cardiovascular deaths, uh, uh, non-fatal myocardial infarction, and non-fatal stroke. Liraglutide was potent in decreasing the, um, to, uh, these primary outcomes, but also the death for, from cardiovascular causes, which was a great surprise because there was no doubt you can figure of this or that, but if you are decreasing cardiovascular death, that's something that uh, about which the discussion is rather limited. But when you look at HbA1c, look what happens during the same trial. HbA1c uh, decreased from 9 to 7, 7, and not less than 7, and then slightly increased while the number of cardiovascular deaths importantly and significantly decreased. So, no connection, no association, definitely. Uh, in the same class, uh, there was a study with semaglutide. Semaglutide is a very potent agent that has shown the most, uh, uh, the most uh, important uh, reduction in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, three composite endpoint, about 26% of the reduction and uh, uh, of, of uh, both of either or, uh, cardiovascular mortality, non-fatal MI, or non-fatal stroke. But if you look for HbA1c, it reached at a certain point less than seven. But however, then with a higher dose, and then slightly increased during the study, while the effect on cardiovascular mortality was on, on trick opposite endpoint was, was superb. And uh, the next one was albiglutide. Albiglutide that uh, 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 again confirmed the primary outcome importance, the decrease of primary outcome, did not change cardiovascular death, increased myocardial infarction significantly, did not change much the stroke, but uh, if you look at HbA1c, it uh, did not reach even 7.5 going down. The lowest level during the trial was about 7.7 .7 of HbA1c, and that it started to increase very slowly. Uh, finally, uh, the last one that uh, joined the family of uh, uh, within, uh, uh, SGLT, within SGLT, uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist was dulaglutide with the positive effect of cardiovascular uh, in three composite outcomes without an effect on cardiovascular death, without an effect on non-fatal myocardial infarction, and uh, with a significant effect on non-fatal stroke. And this agent that did not affect cardiovascular deaths, if you look at HbA1c during this trial, was the only one that decreased at least at a certain point the HbA1c, which was above seven. Although later on it went up until seven, but however, 
did not show, uh, but, but uh, this relationship could not be established with, with the cardiovascular outcomes. So we obtained the positive results, but uh, this, but HB1C could not serve us as a guide to decrease cardiovascular outcomes. Uh, let's see very briefly what is happening with the uh, uh, SGLT2s. The first study in this uh, all group, in this of the, of the positive CVOTs, was the one with the empagliflozin and SGLT2 inhibitor that has shown f for the first time the decrease in uh, three composite outcomes, a significant decrease in, uh, in uh, cardiovascular deaths, and a significant increase in hospitalization for heart failure, and so on. And if you look at HbA1c, it never went uh, down um, below 7.4, with neither of the, uh, of, of the dosages. A canvas study uh, uh, with canagliflozin has also shown the, posit uh, the, ca the cardioprotectivity in a way that decreased three composite endpoints, a positive effect on hospitalization and heart failure. But on the other hand, if we looked at uh, HbO1c, pretty much the same story. Not a significant reduction that we would love to of HbO1c, uh, not reaching lower levels than 7.5 during the whole study, and by the end of the study with HbO1c around 8. Finally, dapagliflozin uh, has shown uh, in, a, some, in some other but similar way that uh, it is decreasing cardiovascular, uh, uh, cardiovascular harm and uh, that uh, as, a, as a primary endpoint was the combined CV death and uh, hospitalization for heart failure. There was a, posit uh, there was a significant uh, outcome for superiority, but you can see how the curve of HbA1c looks like. Pretty much similar to all of the previous studies, except maybe that one with dulaglutide. So, I would like to say that HbA1c does not mean anything for blood glucose control, and does not help reduce, reducing cardiovascular, uh, cardiovascular risk, but uh, Definitely, we did not obtain the reduction of cardiovascular risk through the changes of HbA1c. There was no connection between these two parameters, a reduction of cardiovascular risk and HbA1c. But however, we are diabetologists and we are treating uh, an individual with diabetes and not only it's his or hers cardiovascular risk. So in that context, uh, I would uh, agree that HbA1c has a paramount importance because uh, in these uh, almost a decade, we have concentrated on cardioprotectivity. But if you look at the latest guidelines of uh, uh, ADA-ESD or consensus uh, or this standards of care of uh, this year, you can see that yes, at the beginning of the treatment of HbA1c, of uh, type 2 diabetes, we should make a distinction between the people that have or do not have cardiovascular disease or high risk or end organ damage in a way uh, uh, having uh, uh, renal, renal changes and so on. And if this is the case, so if the answer is positive, we, are go we will go for either SGLT2 inhibitors or JLP1 receptor agonists that have shown cardio and nephroprotectivity. That is true. But uh, we are treating the patient that potentially has other complications of diabetes and has diabetes as a metabolic disease. So we should not forget his or her blood glucose. That's why people put 
Here's something which is rarely emphasized. This is the story about cardioprotectivity. But if at the end of the day, by using of cardioprotective agents, we do not reach HbA1c at the target, if HbA1c is above the target, then we should go into combination with classical, under quotation, classical anti-diabetic drugs, because we have to put HbA1c into the range, into the optimal range. So HbA1c still stands there as a marker of the whole control of diabetes, not only cardiovascular risk, which is just one of the components of the treatment of this particular patient. And in that context, uh, you can see that uh, there are, of course, the role of GLP-1 receptor agonists and the SGL2 inhibitors is very important. But however, people mention DPP-4s, people mention basal insulin, and others. And uh, the only way to know whether we are, going, uh, we are doing a good job or not uh, is to check HbA1c. So in, I would put in this context HbA1c as a sort of overall parameter of the blood uh, control, which f until now does not show the, uh, the, the success of our action in, uh, in order to protect uh, the, from cardiovascular complications, but of course it, uh, it, uh, it preserves its, uh, its value for, for the uh, metabolic control of diabetes in general. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you, Professor Ladic. So, um, I, uh, I feel I'm, um, I, uh, you, you can uh, stay in the, we, if we'll have discussion, maybe you both will stay with me here. Uh, I, I feel I have to, to, to make some, um, uh, not statement, some discussion. Um, so, if uh, uh, we consider HbA1c and cardiovascular risk, HbA1c is proved as uh, being the most important biomarker uh, for the microvascular disease and microvascular complications and uh, co um, microvascular um, uh, uh, um, effect, affecting target organs kidney, uh, eye, retina, brain, maybe. Uh, looking at the cardiovascular global risk, as uh, Professor Lalic said, it is uh, stringent to reduce it from the beginning uh, because in the cardiovascular outcome trials, we've uh, learned that it is possible and we should make this. So maybe both we can, we can, we have to to, to uh, congregate these two um, lines of treatment. But uh, in, uh, my, my concern is in the last uh, um, ESC, um, ESAD uh, guide, they say uh, um, no matter how uh, high the HbA1c is, you have to start with SGLT2 inhibitor or GLP-1 receptor. And I cannot agree with this because uh, if HbA1c is 7.2, it's okay. But if A1c is 10, we cannot uh, delay, we cannot, uh, in my opinion, we cannot wait to, to see what happens uh, and after that start uh, the anti-diabetic uh, classic treatment. What's your opinion, Professor Lodge? I agree completely with you. I mean, uh, there is a, a sort of overemphasizing of the role of uh, new classes of uh, uh, anti-diabetic drugs. Uh, in, in, they are, uh, f first of all, I'm not uh, quite, uh, 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 I'm not quite aware of the studies that have clearly shown 
that in high-risk individuals, uh, SGLT2 inhibitors and, uh, and uh, uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists are decreasing cardiovascular risk in diabetes uh, without any other drugs. So um, it is a little bit extrapolation of what we have from the studies that we have. Uh, there is another story which was uh, which Antonio Ceriello a, a little bit um, and and uh, Con, uh, uh, Francesco Constantino uh, a little bit uh, uh, gave some arguments against that uh, that uh, um, uh, all almost all the studies but the majority of studies definitely are with SGLT2 inhibitors and. Uh, and uh, a GLP-1 receptor agonist plus metformin. The major studies include metformin. So we will have to wait about what is the real value at the beginning of the disease. Uh, but uh, um, then the final uh, result, if uh, maybe I did not read enough literature, but what would be the mechanism that is uh, uh, decreasing the cardiovascular risk of uh, 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 with using SGLT2 inhibitors in uh, people without diabetes. That is very similar to that irrespective to HbA1c. Because, uh, however, uh, SGLT2 inhibitors are working on uh, on uh, on. Uh, um, emphasizing on stimulating the, the glycosuria, in fact, the, uh, the, the output of glucose, and that's how the volume is decreased. I don't know, I'm not aware of any, po of any potential mechanism, maybe, maybe you know, but of any potential mechanism that would counteract the heart failure in non-diabetic people. So, uh, what is the? Uh, uh, but th this is this is to be uh, said. Uh, I, I think that uh, uh, we do not have enough evidence to all to put uh, this, uh, the, these agents uh, at that position at any HbA1c. I'm I'm a little bit uh, a, li a little bit cautious about that. Please, Christian. I'll uh, make a brief uh, comment about uh, Professor Serafin Chanu's statement. I don't think that uh, the guidelines are so much different. Uh, I think we can uh, harmonize the recommendations. So the e e SEC, ESC, ESD say that irrespective of A1C, choose one of the two modern classes. Okay, so we have a uh, high A1C higher than 9% or 10%, then the ADA guideline and the ADA ESD consensus say that if uh, hemoglobin A1C is higher than 9 or 10%, you should initiate a combination of two injectables. So one of the two injectables will be a GLP-1. So you uh, respect both uh, guidelines. You have a cardioprotective GLP-1 and a combination of injectables to decrease A1C. So it's up to us to find the proper pathway. If it's not forbid, forbidden, it's permitted. Yeah, okay. Of <laughs> uh, if there are any comments or questions from the floor. Yes, uh, if I may, uh, may I add also something. Please. Uh, the, uh, if we are reading the e, uh, uh, European Society of Cardiology guidelines in a way, that if you have, if we have a diabetic patient with, uh, um, which, which, who is not on the treatment until having myocardial infarction, or uh, and or or or, or some um, or organ or other organ failure, like kidney, chronic kidney disease, and so on, the first agents of choice. Then we can think of that it can be. SGLT2 inhibitor or GLP-1 receptor agonist. But this is a very limited, pop, sort of limited population. 
uh, so we can, uh, I'm not quite sure that we can speak about uh, the differences uh, in the treatment for all type 2s at the, that have cardiovascular disease. And in, in the case that we have a patient that was not previously treated, of course we will try to give him the agent that has shown, the agents that have shown very efficient cardioprotective effect. And if, if it is put in that format, then I would agree. Yes, this is a very uh, nice interpretation of the guides, but uh, for uh, someone, uh, um, a colleague of us, who's reading the guidelines and uh, he, uh, he read there that you can give, irrespective of uh, HbA1c, you have to give uh, SGLT1 or uh, T1, uh, Yeah, it can be confusing. Okay, inhibitor or GLP-1. Uh, so uh, we have to, to consider also the clinical inertia. The, it is possible to uh, put the patient on an SGLT2 inhibitor and forgive, uh, forget him for uh, five years. Like we have uh, already on metformin a lot of our type 2 diabetic yeah. patients. I think this is uh, uh, quite dangerous. We, we have to start with metformin and both metformin plus SGLT2 inhibitor or GLP-1 in my opinion, this is our professional duty. If there are any, please, please, Russell. Congratulations. I enjoyed very much both, both um, uh, lectures. As a cell biologist, I'm wondering, you lower the glycated, glycosylated hemoglobin. What happens in the cell, with the memory of the cell. Because something takes place at the level of the cell when you lower the, the glycated hemoglobin. And the memory is memory. This concept of uh, metabolic uh, memory is uh, uh, quite uh, well uh, established in the field of diabetes. So it looks uh, like uh, if you have very good glycemic control just from the beginning in the first uh, couple of years, then irrespective of the fact that maybe at a later point you will have a worse glycemic control, the memory will be there inside the cells and this will protect you over time somehow on developing chronic complications. But I think no one knows exactly how this uh, metabolic memory is imprinting inside the cells so they are later on protected from uh, glycemic exposure. It's still a matter of uh, research. Rich, yes. do you want to comment? Uh, uh, the, the same, I mean, unfortunately, when you have some uh, periods of hyperglycemia, and we do not know where, where is the threshold, how long the, this hyperglycemia should last, you can go back to normal glycemia, but you are uh, not correcting the defect. The defect is there on the level of mitochondria, and uh, uh, um, uh, but uh, from the from the papers of uh, Antonio Cheriel and his group, there are some agents that uh, uh, and th this is the area of very intensive work. There are some agents that are trying to target these changes at the level of mitochondria, but they are not uh, anti hyperglycemic agents. They are uh, agents of different kind. There is even a big study by Rob de Fronzo now. Um, um, I, uh, I have to, to finish this session. It was extremely interesting. I think you agree with me. And uh, thank you for uh, the lectures. And uh, uh, I think we have to, to take home this uh, point. 
don't forget HbA1c and don't forget the cardiovascular global risk.